but it's all about change. And this is a good time to talk about change. It's all about becoming more and more like Jesus. We know that's your goal for each and every one of us, perfection. We're not going to reach that overnight. In fact, you say that we won't be there until this world is over and we show up before you then and only then will we be like him. In the meantime, you put us on the anvil and you hammer away. And sometimes it hurts, but we take glances in the mirror and we're becoming and looking more like him every day. That's our goal. So as we face a new year, we ask you to come and to change us. As the clay, we just put ourselves in your hands and on the altar and say, let this year be your year, not ours. Father, as we open your word, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth and him only. And it's in his name. There are so many places that we could go in the Bible to talk about the supernatural battle. Pick a story, and, and there's usually the struggle there between evil and good. James 4, 7 says this. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That's the first thing. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And the question that immediately comes to mind is, how do we resist the devil? There's an old... Psychology 101 teaching, a truism that's proved itself over and over and over again, and it is this, that you are a product of your environment. You're a product of your environment. You are those things that you surround yourself with. We're like chameleons, aren't we? We seem to adapt to our surroundings and our environment. And therefore, we need to be careful in selecting our environment. Even the people that we surround ourselves with, I love Team Challenge, the organization, because it's just amazing the things that they do. We were able to go up and to spend Christmas Day with Stevie and 18 other young men in love and her mom cooked for them. And we spent the day there listening to their stories and getting to know those guys better. And there are some brand new ones that are there, some that have been there less than a month now. And it's so interesting to talk to them and to know that just a month ago they were either in a hospital from an overdose, or they were at the lowest point in their lives, and today they're in Team Challenge, their environment's been changed, and they're already talking about the changes that God is making in their lives. They're already quoting Scripture in a very positive way, and their outlook is totally different, because Team Challenge takes them and puts them in a protected environment and controls that environment so that the positive is the input that they get into their lives. When we're tempted, it becomes a testing of our faith. We don't have to look at it in a negative way. We can succeed or we can fail that testing of our faith. We can get the right answer or the wrong answer, an A or an F. This morning, we're going to take a look at seven things that we can do and use in this coming year to defeat the evil one in our lives. Let's take a look at it. First of all, I want you to see that defeating the enemy is about thinking the right thoughts. Philippians 4, 8 says this, and look at the words. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Think about these things. I think I told you about someone who asked a Jewish mother the ages of her children. She said the doctor is three and the lawyer is five. It's been asked many times why Jewish children go up to be successful in what they choose to do. And it's because they, since they were old enough to walk, that's all they've ever heard. They've been surrounded by an environment of encouragement. In the book, Cowarding, or Parent, it's a microphone. In the book, Parenting Isn't for Cowards by James Dobson, he states over and over that your child lives up to your expectations. And what that means is, moms and dads, that if you say to your children you're not going to amount to anything, then they won't. If you say to them you're going to be nothing but trouble, then they'll live up to your expectations. But on the other hand, look at the responsibility that you have to encourage your kids and tell them that the greatest power source in the universe is on their side. And as long as they keep their thoughts centered around Jesus, they can accomplish anything that they put their mind to. And with that kind of positive environment, those things can become a reality too. Because you see, you are what you think. 
I said before, you are what you are when you're alone with your thoughts. Who are you when you're alone with your thoughts? What's written on the walls of your mind? When those closest people to you who know you the best are not around and you're simply by yourself, what's written on the walls of your mind? Who are you when your mask's off? And I'll say this, you are what you've decided to be. You are what you've decided to be. We need to fill our minds with good thoughts, positive thoughts that come from righteous thinking because the opposite is stinking thinking. You're to take every thought captive, the Bible says. And if you've ever thought about that before without trying to do it, it may seem easy, but it's very difficult to do, but it can be done. And that's something that we need to try and do as we go into a new year. Take every thought captive. If a thought comes into your mind, if it's a good thought, let it come. Dwell on it. Think on it. If it's a bad thought, if it's a wicked or evil thought, don't take it. Say no and let it go. One night a father amidst the cries and the screams of his young son coming from the nursery quickly ran in and turned on the light to prove to his little boy there were no bears in the room. His father said, see son, there aren't any bears in here. And the little boy said, daddy, the kind of bears I see are the kind that only come out in the dark. I want you to know I can identify with that. When the demons appear at 3 o'clock in the morning and everybody else is asleep and you're there alone, there's an old cliche that says that if you can change your attitude, you can change your life. If you change your attitude, you can change your life. Let me tell you, it's more than a cliche. Some people think it's not possible. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. I'm here to tell you by the blood of Christ that you can. You can change a pessimist into an optimist. You can change a half-empty kind of guy into a half-full kind of guy. You can change someone who talks about stoplights into looking at the green and calling them go lights. You can talk about someone who talks about a 50% forecast of rain and they hold on to the hope that there's a 50% forecast of sunshine. God wants you to think positive thoughts, dwelling on the good things. He is the creator of all that is good and perfect. And those are the things that we should fill our minds with. The old computer programmer's motto of the 1970s, garbage in, garbage out, you remember that? It's true of the mind too, because it's a precious computer. But the reverse also holds true. Goodness in, goodness out. Goodness in, goodness out. Think the right thoughts and you'll have victory. In the battleground that counts the most, the battleground of the mind, where Satan wins most of his battles. Secondly, I want you to see that we're not only to think the right thoughts to win this battle, we're to see the right sights. Hebrews 12.2 says this, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. A lot of us fix our eyes on something other than Jesus. And that's where we get into trouble. Do you remember Peter walking on the water to Jesus? As long as he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus, he could do the impossible. He could walk on water. But his downfall was literally when he took his eyes off of Jesus. A lady was showing a church friend her neighbor's wash through her back window. Mabel said to Millie, Millie, would you look? Look at her sheets. Would you look at those dark streaks on those sheets? She never gets them clean. Millie said to Mabel, you know, Mabel, I don't think those streaks are on her sheets. I think those are on your window. <laughs> a lot of us are like that, aren't we? We see only the faults of others. And that's what we seem to look for all of the time when we overlook the good. We need to balance. Jesus said you need to be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Years ago, one night at the supper table, after the prayer, Stevie said, Daddy, Andy didn't have his eyes closed during the prayer. I said, Stevie, how do you know? He was so busy finding fault with his brother that he didn't realize he was guilty of the very same thing. It happens, doesn't it? When we don't see the right sights or, or look for the right things in people. And if you're looking for something wrong, something negative, you're going to find it. Because when you got a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. Jesus had a teaching on that in the Sermon on the Mount, in the seventh chapter of Matthew, where he says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? 
We need to be careful of the things that we look at and the things that we see. King David got into trouble when he went looking at the wrong things. Bathsheba, up on the roof taking a bath, he looked and he lingered and he desired and she became pregnant and he killed her husband. All kinds of terrible things came from him just looking at the wrong thing. You know, I feel sorry and pray, I've been praying a lot for those first responders that had to go to the Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. We have firemen and policemen and EMTs in this church. And I've talked to them about the job and what they see, and I still have things from being a policeman that haunt me, that got into my mind that will never get out. And can you imagine anything more worse than what they saw with those six and seven-year-olds? Once it gets in, it doesn't get out. Once you see something, you can't unsee it. What do you let your mind dwell on? What kind of movies do you watch? What kind of television shows do you watch? When our boys were little, it was G-rated movies, PG if we saw it, that's just the rules and the way that it was. And the thing that we wanted to keep them away from the most was the evil, the horror movies, the Stephen King type of stuff that was coming out. We could always tell when they had snuck and watched one of those. They'd gone and stayed all night with a friend. On Friday night or Saturday night, they came back the next morning and then that night, they would want the light left on in the hallway. They would sneak down in the middle of the night and crawl into bed with us. Because once that evil made its way in, it couldn't make its way out. Once you see something, you can't unsee it. Let me read you a poem. There's no author given. And it's entitled, The Guy in the Glass. When you get what you want in your struggle for self, and the world makes you king for a day, then you go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that guy has to say. For it isn't your mother or brother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The person whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. You may be like Jack Horner and chisel a plum and think you're a wonderful guy. But the man in the glass says you're a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. He's the fellow to please, never mind all the rest, because he's with you clean to the end. And you pass your most dangerous and difficult test if the guy in the glass is your friend. You may fool the whole world down the pathway of yours and get pats on the back as you pass. But your final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the guy in the glass. Let me tell you something, folks. You're not in this thing to please the guy in the glass. You're to deny him and please the guy with the cross. Thirdly, I want you to see that we're not only to think the right thoughts and see the right sights, we're also to hear the right sounds. Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Love's Grandma Gray had a print of a painting up on the wall called Christ at the Door. Maybe you've seen it before. It's a picture of Jesus standing at the door, and it's an <laughs> illustration of Revelation 3.20. He who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And I pointed out to the boys that there was no handle on Jesus' side of the door. He can't force his way in. He can't even open the door. You've got to open it from the other side. You've got to let him in. They were discussing it after they were looking at it. Billy studied the painting and he said, you know, I wonder why they don't let him in. And Andy replied, maybe they're down in the basement and they didn't hear him. Too often we spend time in the basement. Our lives are spent in the cellars of sin where we simply can't hear his voice with all the evil around. What do you allow your ears to hear? The question we need to ask ourselves is, not is God speaking, but am I listening? Because I guarantee you that God is speaking. When Lou and I were first married, after our honeymoon, we moved into a house out on Ewing Street, sat back off the road in 17 acres of wheat fields. And the first night we were there after our honeymoon, 
we realized that there was a train track 100 feet from the back door. And every time that it would come to that Rockford Road, it would honk that horn and we'd literally come out of bed. When we moved to Chicago, we were at the southeast corner when we rented a house in Franklin Park at first. We were at the southeast corner of O'Hare Field, an approach to the landing strip there. And those big jets would come over the house and we would literally come out of our beds again. Somebody gave us a, a fan. And so we started turning it on all the time in our bedroom. So we, we could just listen to the roar of the fan and it would kind of blot out all the sounds that was coming in from outside. We turned it on high because the more we listened to it, the better it worked. We could just drown out the other things that were around us. We had that fan for about 15 years till we went to Florida. And it wasn't long after we got it till it started making a little bit of noise. The bearings were going out of it. It was an old fan. And the louder it got when the bearings were going out, the, the better we liked it because it helped to drown out the sound. And then finally the bearings froze and the fan had to be thrown away and we went to yard sales looking for an old fan with the bearings that were going out. <laughs> but we ended up getting us one of these little machines that sits on the nightstand called a, a satin soother. It's got about 30 different sounds that you can put in there and we put this one on with the roar of a waterfall so that we can go to sleep at night and not hear the things going on in the house or outside. You ever get used to a sound? that you're constantly around. Sometimes we don't hear the right sounds anymore because we've blocked them out. We've not listened to them for so long that our hearts have become hardened. And we need to remember when God speaks, He seldom ever shouts. It's usually the softest of whispers. Revelation 12.10 says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That he stands before the throne of God day and night accusing us, pointing the finger, and those are the negative tapes that you hear running in your mind all the time. It's when you feel guilty about something you did years ago and you've been forgiven for. And Satan says to you, how could you possibly do that? You're not any good. I don't even know why you come to church. God's not concerned about you. He's given up on you. You're not going to grow. You're not going to mature. You're not what he's looking for. It's time in 2013 to turn those tapes off and to get back in tune with the good and righteous things that God puts in our lives. And then fourth thing I want you to see, we're not only to think the right thoughts, see the right sights, and hear the right sounds, we're to say the right words. Matthew 12, 34, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or another way to put it is, what's down in the well will come up in the bucket, Right? What's down in the well will come up in the bucket. When I became a Christian back in 1986, I lost one third of my vocabulary. The tongue is sometimes the tail that wags the dog, right? Or as James, the brother of Jesus, puts it, it's like a, a small rudder, and yet it moves this huge ship. It's like a small bit, and yet it turns this big horse. It's like a small spark, and, and yet it causes this huge forest fire. Oscar Levant once said, the first thing I do in the morning is brush my teeth and sharpen my tongue. Some people have that problem. And before they know it, they've ruined a friendship or destroyed a reputation or, or even cursed God without even knowing it. It shouldn't be that way, folks. Not in 2013. What's down in the well will come up in the bucket. What's in your heart will come out your mouth. And we've got to constantly work on the well water so that it's righteous things that are coming up in that bucket. Christianity is a matter of the heart, but it's a matter of the mouth too. Jesus said, they'll know that you belong to me because of the words you choose. No, he said, they'll know you belong to me because you love one another. And if you love one another, the words that you choose will be the right words. The way you talk is very important. <laughs> When I write a sermon, one of the time, things that I do is practice it time after time after time before I come and give it here for you on Sunday morning. And the reason that I do that is there are so many ways to say one thing. You can take one sentence and say it in a bunch of different ways so that it soothes and ministers, so that it shows compassion, or so that it offends. Words hurt. 
The old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the power of life and death lie in the tongue. The power of life and death lies in the tongue. Hurt people. Hurt people. My boys have never heard me say a negative thing about their mother. You have never heard, nor will you hear me say a negative thing about Love Lockman. It's a choice that I make. After living three years in Atlanta, we moved to Chicago. Billy, growing up there in Atlanta, when he went to his first day of kindergarten, he came home and he said, Mama, what's a hillbilly? Because of his accent, the Chicago kids called him a hillbilly. And he grew up in Chicago and we moved to the mountains of East Tennessee. He went to his first day of kindergarten there and came home and said, Mama, what's a Yankee? <laughs> it's the same way with living the Christian life. People ought to know who we belong to by the way that we talk. Do you remember the servant girl with Peter? They were in the courtyard of the high priest. Peter was denying and said, You were with Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, No, I wasn't. She said, Yes, you were. I know you were because you're... Your accent, your Galilean accent gives you away. We ought to have a Galilean accent. We ought to have an accent that shows that we've been with Jesus. The Sandy Patty song, Love in Any Language, she talks about love being the universal language of the heart. And it is. I remember when we were in Israel, one time in the upper room, it wasn't anything like I pictured. It was huge, high ceilings and a very big room. We went in and we were the only tour group that was there. We had a communion service there in the upper room. And then we closed our eyes and we began to praise God. And we were singing the song, Hallelujah. And as we sang and praised God, the, our voices got louder. And, and it came, became stronger and stronger. And we opened our eyes and we looked around. And the room was full of Christians. Asian Christians, Nigerian Christians, Russian Christians. The place was packed. We couldn't have communicated with them if we wanted to in their language, but that word hallelujah is the same in any language. You ever called your dog after they've done something bad? But you know if you're mean to them, they'll run away and you'll never catch them. So what do you do? You smile. And you say, come here. Come here, you little mutt. Come here, you stupid little troublemaker. Look what you've done. Look what you've eaten. You worthless, flea-bitten bag of bones. Come here. But the dog came, didn't he? He didn't understand the words, but he understood the heart that offered them. Get the heart right with God and words will come. Fifthly, I want you to see that we need also to do the right things. Hebrews 13, 21 says this, May God equip you with everything good for doing His will. Ecclesiastes says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your heart. Don't forget you're going to be judged by your actions, not by your intentions. Say it again. You'll be judged by your actions, not by your in intentions. John Motley once said, Monuments, what are they? The very pyramids have forgotten their builders or to whom they were dedicated. Deeds, not stones, are the true monuments of the great. Jesus would agree with that. Jesus called us to be Christians of deeds, didn't He? He said, don't tell me, show me. He said, faith without works is what? Dead. Stone cold corpse, the Greek says. We need to make sure that the things that we do are pleasing to Him. I had an elder at a church I served in Florida. He thought quite a bit of himself. I remember when I got there, I began preaching grace, which was all I knew how to do. And one night at a board meeting, we were all sitting around a conference table, and he had his Bible on the table in front of him. And he got up, and he took his fist, and he pounded that Bible on the table, and he said, Grace! Grace, grace, that's all you ever preach is grace. When are you going to preach holiness, holiness, holiness? The 
The following week, I was working late at the church. My office was upstairs. There wasn't a window to the outside. You couldn't really tell if I was there when I had the door closed. I finished and I was locking up. And I caught this elder having sex with a member of the praise team in the church building. Both of them were married, not to each other. They both had families. I literally walked in on them and caught them in the act. And I said to the elder, do you want a sermon on grace or one on holiness? When we become a Christian, we are called to change and to do the right things. And so I'm a Christian, I've been baptized, I go to church, but what are you doing for the Lord? In Albert Camus' book, The Fall, it deals with the guilt of a man who lets another man drown because there was no one to watch him save the man. We need to be committed to an audience of one. If he's the only one that sees it, he always does. Don't tell me you're a fisherman. Let me see your catch. Don't tell me you're a great baseball player. What's your batting average? Don't tell me you're a great carpenter. Show me something that you built. Don't tell me you're a Christian, Jesus says. Show me by deeds, by what you do. And then sixthly, he says that we can defeat Satan by going to the right places. Psalm 20, 122, verse 1. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Somebody said when you flee temptation, be sure not to leave a forwarding address. It's important that Christians go to the right places, isn't it? It really is. You can tell a person's priorities and commitment by the places that he or she goes. I'm not going to preach to the choir, but ask yourselves the question, am I committed to this place? Am I committed to church attendance? Am I committed to God and the family of God? Am I here for services every Sunday morning? Am I involved in a Sunday school class? Do I go to Bible study on Wednesday night? You don't have to answer me or give me an excuse. Don't get me wrong, I'm going to care, but someday you'll have to give answer to Him. No matter where you go, He always, always sees. Seventh and finally, I want you to see that we're not only to think the right thoughts to beat Satan at his game, to see the right sights, hear the right sounds, say the right words, do the right things, go to the right places. But seventh and finally, if we do those things, we belong to the right person. John 15, 16, Jesus speaking, You did not choose me, but I chose you. You didn't choose me, I chose you. All the things that we've mentioned up until now will show you who you belong to. If you provide in 2013 environment for yourself, if you think the right thoughts, if you see the right sounds, or see the right sights, hear the right sounds, say the right words, do the right things, go to the right places, then you can defeat the enemy. You'll belong to the right person. Let me leave you with that question that's almost become a cliche. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you? Let me finish with this. Let me give you two similar experiences and a change I've made since they happened. A number of years ago when I was traveling for the Atlanta Saw Company out of Atlanta, I was in Vancouver, British Columbia, 3,000 miles away from Atlanta. I finished the day's business, I'd eaten supper, and I went out jogging afterwards, and then came back to my hotel room. When I came back to the hotel room, the message light was blinking on my phone. This was back before the days of cell phones or even voicemail. So I called down to the front desk and I said, this is Bill Lockman and gave the room number. Do you have a message for me? And she said, yes. She said, you're to call home immediately. Your wife called. Your house has been robbed. I called home immediately and I could hear the panic in Love's voice. She'd taken the two boys and gone to Wednesday night Bible study. Andy was just a baby. And she came home to our new home and it had been broken into. The whole place had been ransacked. They had stolen some of my guns and police badges that she had made and put up on a plaque for me. They took a pillowcase off one of the pillows on our bed and they just started filling it up, dumped her jewelry box into it. They went through everything. She felt so vulnerable and I felt so helpless. 
I was 3,000 miles away and there was nothing that I could do except talk to her. Her dad tried to get her to go home to spend the night with them. She said, no, if I'm going to live here, I've got to learn to live here tonight. Fast forward a few years. I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma after becoming a pastor for a conference that was going on there. After the evening session, I came back to my hotel room and that message light in my hotel room on the phone was blinking. I could just feel the, the fear and the panic set in. It had been years ago. I called down to the front desk and I said, do you have a message for me? I gave her my name and my room number. Thinking the worst. And she said, yes, I do. Your wife called. And she said to tell you, Stevie hit a home run. I don't know about you. But in 2013, I'm defeating Satan. You want to join me? I'm receiving the only good news in the coming year. I'm going to live in hope and not in fear. How about you? Let's pray. Father, the choices that you give us in our lives are unmeasurable. We've got a choice to make every second of every day when the thoughts come into our minds. And the Bible says, Jesus' words were, if you're not for me, you're against me. And so if we don't cast a vote in favor of you with righteous thinking in a righteous environment, we cast a vote against you and one for the devil. I thank you for making it simple and giving us all the choices that we have. I pray that you'll help us to make the right choices. I pray that we will create a new environment for ourselves in 2013. That we will think the right thoughts and see the right sights, hear the right sounds, go to the right places, say the right words. That we'll get our lives in tune with what you want. And that we'll realize that WWJD wasn't just a successful bracelet, that it's a way of life. Whenever we're faced with a choice or a decision, we ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? And then do it knowing that it pleases you more than anything else. Be with us in this coming year. Father, we've got just a couple of days left before a new year. It can literally transform us by the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ. We thank you for him. We thank you for his example. And we know that someday you've promised that we're going to be like him. Philippians 1, 6, what you started in us, you're going to bring to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Someday we shall be like him. What a deal.